14th century, from 1300 to 1400, I'm calling this the century of the shaking of papal authority. It's been happening for a long time. My hypothesis is going clear back to the formation of the papal states when the Pope became, along with a religious leader, a political king. From that, <clears throat> from that time on, we've really seen a kind of deterioration of the moral authority of the Pope. It doesn't happen immediately, but century by century, we see this sort of trajectory in which the Pope is becoming increasingly viewed in a kind of cynical way. Now, Catholic faithful would never say that. This is rather subtle. This is rather kind of uh, under the radar. But nevertheless, part of the psyche of Europe seems to be increasingly suspicious that the Pope is not one who is simply acting in the best interest of spiritual truths, but that there's another agenda going on that seems to be informing to some degree what's happening. But that really hits a new low with the 14th century, and it has to do with the events that took place during that century. Up until this time, the papacy had been more or less the unifying principle. Feudalism is a very decentralizing political kind of arrangement. The Crusades, of course, had quite an impact in Europe. The one thing you felt you could rely on as a center, a kind of stabilizing heart of society would be the papacy in particular, the Roman Catholic leadership in general, and that had been the case. But when we get to the 14th century, two events really do sabotage deeply that confidence, whatever was left of it. The first of these is commonly called the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Okay, be honest. How many of this room have heard of the so-called Babylonian captivity of the papacy? Two? Good. Three? Anybody else? Are you just being shy? I'm, this makes me so happy. I want you to get your money's worth, you know? So I don't want to just review stuff that's obvious. But many people have never heard of this. But this was one of the most famous developments in the history of the Catholic Church, certainly for hundreds of years thereafter, and it picked up this nickname. Now you know the original Babylonian captivity was in the Old Testament when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and hauled off the elite of Israel to Babylon, and they were there technically for 70 years. It wasn't quite 70 years, but from the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 to the re inauguration of the worship at the temple in 516 was 70 years. And Jeremiah had in himself uh, predicted in his prophecy that there would be this 70-year sort of interregnum, if you will, uh, interruption in the worship at the temple, and the land was going to recover. It was going to recover its Sabbaths. So that came to be called the Babylonian captivity of the Jewish people. Interestingly, what takes place at this point is we have the Pope outside of Rome under the care of and under the heavy influence of the French king, living in a little region called Avignon, which is just outside France, not technically part of France, but under French influence for about 70 years, you see, about 69 years. The Pope is out of town, and so the view came to be that the Pope was sort of being sucked in by this French influence and he was losing even more of his independent authority. He was becoming a pawn, as it were, of the French king. And by the enemies and those who were critical of the Pope, that was eventually called the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. So that's where that term came from. We'll say a little more about it in a moment. The second event that takes place in this century is called the Great Papal Schism. This happens right on the heels of this so-called Babylonian captivity. When the Pope comes back to town, there's sort of a great eruption of violence, and the result of all of that is you get multiple popes for a while. There's two popes, and sometimes there's three popes, all claiming to be the true pope, and all basically excommunicating the other ones. And so the whole thing begins to appear pretty pathetic, you see, from the point of view of the casual observer of life in the church. This doesn't seem like the kind of dignity that should characterize the leadership of the church. And again, it has the effect of distancing Christian faithful from their high confidence in the Pope that had theretofore been the case. So these are the two events. 
the man who is sort of at the, the, the who, whose life takes place during the first of these is John Wycliffe. And in some ways, we have to understand Wycliffe in light of this backstory. The guy whose life takes place against the second of them, the schism, is John Huss. And again, we have to understand his story a little bit against that. So I want to look this morning at the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Next week, we want to look at this schism. And at the same time, we'll look at these two characters that I'm mentioning to you. So that's our agenda. And uh, so let's go ahead with that. We have the Babylonian captivity. It begins with a guy whose name is Boniface, literally beautiful face. And you would agree, wouldn't you? Boniface the Eighth. 1294 to 1303. So he's the Pope at the beginning of the events that lead up to this Babylonian captivity. What happened was the French king, whose name is Philip IV, who rules until 1314 and is part of what's called the Capetian kings. Hugh Capet, back in the Frankish kingdom in the 10th century, established a dynasty that went on for several hundred years. And the kings that followed were, for the most part, fairly competent political leaders. They weren't necessarily very religious men, but they were pretty good at running France. And this fellow, Philip IV, is one of these Capetian kings. He happens to be at war with Edward I, who is the king in England. Edward I, you may know his story because he's also famous for his conflicts with William Wallace, who was Braveheart up in Scotland. But he was equal opportunity. He fought everybody, you see. And so Edward I is in a squabble with Philip, and the squabble has to do with who is the rightful ruler of various parts of France. This conflict had started clear back with the Norman invasion in 1066 and had continued to be a topic of conflict and violence and sporadic outbreaks of war between these two countries over the centuries since then. So France and England, you know, never were really good buddies at any time in history. And this was really the heart of the matter. So these two kings, not surprisingly, are in conflict. However, as it turns out, Philip is getting the worst of it. And he's needing money in a bad way. And so he decides, where can I find some extra funds? And he notices all of those Catholic churches throughout England are pretty well endowed. They've got huge treasuries. The Catholic faithful have been bringing their tithes and their alms and their offerings and so on. And there's a gradual accumulation of fairly striking wealth in the churches in France. And so Philip, because he's the king, says, hey, you know, I could use that money. Turn it over. Well, Boniface, who is the pope at the time, didn't like that proposition. And as a result of that, he announced with a kind of breathtaking clarity something that had at least been working implicitly down through several centuries. But he announces that, in a kind of point-blank way, the pope is the highest authority in the world. So this is a papal bull. It's called the Unum Sanctum. And these are the follies, kind of bullets that come out of this. He said, the Pope is the highest authority on earth. He is higher than all parliaments and all kings, that all men and nations had to acknowledge that authority, that it was absolutely necessary to submit to the a Pope in order to acquire eternal salvation. And that is, if you rejected that proposition, you were lost. That's pretty sweeping. I don't know about you, but, you know, that would get my attention. So here's a guy that's claiming to be, essentially, king of the earth, Boniface. And he says, on the basis of that authority, he is repudiating the command issued by Philip for the churches to relinquish their funds. And that if Philip didn't submit to that, he would be eternally damned. At the moment, Philip was more concerned about winning his battle with Edward than about his eternal soul. And so, in order to deal with this problem, he simply attacks Rome and captures the Pope and throws him into prison. And 
the Pope was so shattered by that that he actually died within a few months. Boniface II does not go down as one of the greatest popes in history. If you've read Dante's Inferno, you know that he mentions by name several popes. Boniface gets special mention as a pope who winds up in the very hottest precincts of hell. According to Dante, I'm passing no judgment on that person. I'm just reporting to you. That was kind of the impression that was left. So anyway, that's Boniface. And that does create this very interesting now swirling set of political implications because you have a king who has just attacked and imprisoned a pope and really nothing quite like that has ever happened in the history of the church up until this time. The next pope is Benedict the 11th. He rules for only one year. He maintains this hostile relationship with Philip but dies rather suddenly and the common wisdom is he died because he was poisoned by a French agent. So the intrigue is just wonderful, don't you agree? I mean, church history, who could ever call it dull? This is made for movie stuff and it brings the next pope who is Clement V. Now Clement V made a side deal with Philip that if he were made pope, he would do Philip's bidding. This was not commonly known. The problem you had among the cardinals at the time was there was a substantial number of Italian cardinals and a substantial number of French cardinals. The two groups greatly ex uh, outnumbered all the rest of the cardinals who were much less of a minority. And so it really took some kind of agreement between these two to get a pope, you see. Up until this time, it had commonly been viewed that the pope should be Italian, and most of the popes had been Italian. But now Philip wants a pope who is really more inclined to favor the French. But he knows he cannot get the Italian cardinals to vote for a French pope. And so he makes a deal with Clement, who is neither Italian nor French, and appears to be neutral. But it's a closeted deal, a secret deal, smoke-filled room, in which Clement agrees, if, if I become the pope, I'll support you, Philip. The Italians don't know any better. The French may be in on it or not, we don't know, but in any event, they vote for the guy. Clement V becomes the next pope. Clement V is beholden, therefore, to Philip. Philip is finally getting what he wants from the papacy. So he's elected on condition of uh, serving Philip. And there are several things that happen under the reign of these two guys. The first probably famous one is they raided the Knights Templar. So on Friday the 13th, 1307, with the Pope's agreement and support, Philip ordered that the Knights Templar essentially be shut down. Many of them were killed, a few escaped, but the reason he did that was for money. The Knights Templar were reputed to have accumulated a great deal of wealth from their transactions back and forth during the Crusades and various things they had found, among them the alleged Holy Grail, but we won't talk about that anymore. And all of this was supposed to be part of their cash, and now Philip is able to invade and get the funds that are available there. And of course, since that time, Friday the 13th has been an unlucky day. That's where that little lore got started. Two years later, Clement moves from Rome to Avignon. And this is the beginning then in 1309 of this Babylonian captivity. And so just to make it clear that this Clement is not going to be adversarial to Philip, but in fact is going to be in many ways, I don't mean this too disparagingly, but historians have used this term, the lapdog of Philip. He moves into Avignon into great splendor into a wonderful and wealthy and opulent kind of lifestyle there, supported by the French king, but doing the French king's bidding. And that takes place in 1309. As it turns out, as the Pope is leaving town, war breaks out in Italy between the armies of the Pope, the Pope has his own armies, and the armies of Venice, which at that point has an imperial presence throughout the world. And so Italy is more or less left aflame in, in uh, uh, a kind of a warring state as the Pope leaves and winds up in Avignon, and uh, the, that battle continues in Italy for some time. But just to kind of illustrate how political things have become for the Pope. All right, Clement dies in uh, 1314. That brings John the 22nd, the next of these. He's the second Avignon Pope. He, interestingly, 
really digs the wealth of living in Avignon. And these guys were living in unspeakable luxury. I, I think I'm safe in saying that. And by the way, if I sound like I'm being harsh on the popes, I am. But a lot of the material I'm getting, I'm getting from Roman Catholic historians. I just want to make that clear. This is, this, any fair-minded Roman Catholic historian will agree this was a very, very low point for the papacy. And you don't find many rising up in the defense of what was going on. So I think I'm giving you a fairly even-handed treatment of this, even though it sounds pretty hostile. I am a Protestant, after all, so I guess I'll you know, let you know that much. But, uh, but this really is pretty much uh, an accepted view of it. This uh, character, John the 22nd, was controversial for many things, but probably the thing that made him most famous was he thought that the great wealth of the church, especially the wealth as he was experiencing, it was a proof of God's blessing on the church. It was kind of a prosperity gospel sort of implication. I know I'm in God's favor because God has blessed us with all this wealth. You see, that was kind of the idea, the premise for it. That made it a little bit embarrassing that there were these characters out there, this new order of monks we talked about a couple of weeks ago, known as the Franciscans, who celebrated poverty and simplicity and seemed to be a little bit of a thorn in the conscience of the Catholic psyche and especially of the Pope. Well, this Pope just met fire with fire. He basically condemned the Franciscans. Now, not quite. I don't want to overstate that. But he came perilously close to condemning them precisely because they were so committed to an impoverished way of life. He felt like that was contradictory to the real flavor of what would be an evidence of God's blessing. That didn't score him many points in the popular uh, estimation, that uh, particular view. He was so un disfavored uh, that actually during his reign back in Rome, a so-called anti-pope was established. An anti-pope is, is one who claims to be the pope when there's another one who is gener generally regarded as the pope. This is not the great schism yet, but it's one little hint toward that development. But he lived in extraordinary wealth. This would be wealth on the order of Louis XIV and Versailles. I mean, just over the top, sumptuous banquets, eating constantly, all kinds of parties, all kinds of entertainments, just over the top uh, consumption, I think you would say, if you could visit. And, and John XXII really liked that approach to life. He died in uh, 1334. That brings Benedict the Twelfth. This is the moment when a conflict breaks out between France and England that's been brewing for a long time, but finally kind of erupts and is going to continue for a good long time, and it's called the Hundred Years' War. The Hundred Years' War was essentially a territorial dispute between France and England over how much of France England had a right to control. The, the English actually claimed that they should be ruling over all of France. The French, of course, saw it differently. And over the course of this hundred years, there was a kind of waxing and waning of the real estate dominated by England in France. So if you could look at a map, kind of a moving map, you'd see over the years how the amount of uh, land that they controlled gen uh, kind of changed or fluctuated over the years. Well, it's under the, con uh, under the reign of Benedict the, the 11th that this hundred years war breaks out. A little bit of trivia, by the way. Who's the most famous warrior associated with the Hundred Years' War? The single most famous, every person in this room knows the answer. No, pardon me? Who said that? Was that Herm? Say that again. No, no, somebody said it. Well, Chuck, is it you? Somebody said, I heard it. Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, was that you, Wally? Good, okay, thank you. Joan of Arc. And uh, I'll do a little cameo of Joan, Joan of Arc, but not until about four months from now. So put it on your calendar if you're interested in Joan of Arc, but we won't get to her this spring. Anyway, that's the Hundred Years' War. But the point of mentioning it now is that as this conflict erupts between the English and the French, the Pope is utterly, totally, unquestionably supportive of the French perspective. This is a fully partisan and political kind of agenda now that is being implemented by the Pope. The French are utterly virtuous in this conflict. The English are utterly outside the bounds of their proper authority. 
That didn't set very well with the English, you see, who felt that they had a legitimate claim here and that that was the reason. And this is the beginning of something that's rather subtle. I don't want to overstate it, but there is along this time frame the beginning of what amounts to a gradual distancing between the English and the Pope. Not that there weren't faithful Roman Catholic all through the years, and, and of course England remained officially Catholic until Henry VIII, but there was still a kind of jaded sort of suspicion about the Pope. And that's why when Henry VIII announced that the, true, the next Pope was actually himself, the true head of the church in England, the English people were actually, for the most part, okay with that. They didn't like the Pope that much anyway, you see, and they hadn't liked him much for hundreds of years, really dating back to this time frame. So it begins to establish a kind of a rift in the confidence of the English, especially with respect to the Pope. And that begins at this point because the Pope was so partisan in supporting the French against the English during these days. So anyway, we have next uh, Clement VI. Uh, he reigns during the Black Death. The, the worst, of course, the plague came and went many times over the years, but the worst outbreak of this was between the years 1348 and 1350. We mentioned some a couple of weeks ago that the uh, reason, at least probably, for the Black Death was because these so-called free towns had been created at the latter part of the Crusades and people who could get into these towns were protected by the charters that had been established between the town and the local princes. And so it was, a, it was kind of a place to, to escape from the tyranny of feudalism. And many people flooded into these towns over the years and would find some kind of employments there in trade and other sorts of activities. And so the free towns had really been burgeoning now for some time. But unfortunately, their sanitary uh, technology was pretty you know, backwards and it gave rise to an awful lot of disease processes and it all sort of erupted with the bubonic plague in 1348 and it wiped out just huge numbers something like a third of european population was wiped out this raised huge questions about the pope because the question was is this god's judgment have things gotten so bad that god is now pouring out his wrath on us many people were coming to that conviction and so the Pope, of course, in order to save face, had to do something. And this particular Pope, Clement VI, announced that every person who died in the plague had complete plenary forgiveness of sins and went straight to heaven. You see. And people were relieved to hear that, of course. But again, you can tell that probably in the back of their minds, they're still wondering, is that something the Pope can actually do? And so you can kind of see that sort of thing happening. All right, a couple of other posts we won't talk about there. They just kind of fill in the blanks here. Innocent the sixth, uh, Urban the sixth. But the one I do want to zero in on, uh, the last of these so-called Avignon popes is Gregory the 11th. Gregory the 11th, this is the only image I could, it looks like a crook to me, like organized crime there. That is the only image I could come up with. I would have found something more complimentary, but that was all that was out there, so that's it. He's the last of the Avignon popes. He's famous for a couple of reasons, one of which is that he launches a fierce, a ferocious persecution of the Lollards. The Lollards I mentioned earlier are those people who had been trained by John Wycliffe. They were the psalm singers. They had gone out through England and eventually through uh, various parts of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Germany, and uh, they were viewed as an increasing threat because, of course, they represented what seemed to be a simple New Testament message as against this convoluted, highly politicized, kind of corrupted leadership of the church, and many people were responding favorably. And this pope was worried about that. He saw the threat. And so he actually condemned the Lollards, and at this time he was uh, authorized uh, some horrific persecutions, including uh, burning at the stake and various kinds of torture and so on that took place with respect to the Lollards. The other thing he did, and we'll come back in a moment to look at this more closely, but he condemned Wycliffe's most famous single document, which was entitled On Civil Dominion. Wycliffe published this, and it was condemned by the Pope in 1377. 
And for those two reasons in particular, we uh, are interested in, in uh, uh, Gregory XI. He did, however, return the papacy back to Rome in 1378. And so this is the official end of the Babylonian captivity. It lasts just 69 years, almost 70 years, and then he's back in Rome, but he dies the same year in 1378. What happens immediately after is what I call the great papal schism because the Italian people were so upset, so outraged, that this series of popes had ruled in Avignon rather than in Rome where they belonged, that when the papal or the uh, cardinal conclave gathered to elect a new pope on the death of Gregory, a mob broke in to the meeting room where the cardinals were meeting and considering the election of the next pope, and they basically threatened outright violence against these cardinals if they didn't elect an Italian pope, at which time the cardinals promptly elected an Italian pope. And then the French cardinals, in fear for their life, fled back to France and promptly elected a French pope, claiming that the Italian pope was illegitimate. And that issues forth the great papal schism that lasts for about 40 years. I'm not going to pursue that story because that'll be our subject next week, but I just want you to know that's what happened. So in 1378, note that date, we'll be seeing it again in a moment, uh, this great papal schism erupts and it takes place on the death of Gregory. All right, against the backdrop of all of this, enter John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was born in 1330 in England. We know very little, really, about his early life. We know he was born into a family of some means, but not overly rich. He was a brilliant child. He was given an ex a very good education, and uh, so we know all of that about him, but beyond that, we don't have a lot of the detail. He did, however, at about 30 years of age, become a professor at Oxford, which was quite a remarkable achievement, and it speaks to the brilliance of the man. This would be quite young, of course, to be uh, placed into that position. He became a doctor of divinity in 1372. His own writings tell us that early in his career, his life was all about John Wycliffe. He knew he was brilliant and he wanted the world to know it. And so he spent a lot of time trying to prove to people his brilliance. You know, he was just a young, fairly arrogant scholar. That would be his own description of himself. But it does seem that as he did his theological studies, and especially as he began to read uh, the, the New Testament itself, he was increasingly impressed at the, the disconnect between the life that seemed to be described in the New Testament and the life that seemed to be evident in the higher echelons of the church. And over time, Wycliffe, at some point or other, and we're not clear which, really does seem to embrace an understanding of the Christian gospel that would be very like what eventually came out of the Reformation, justification by faith alone, kind of a Lutheran view of things before Luther, you see. And so Wycliffe, we don't know when exactly, we just know that it happened somewhere along the line. And as a result of that, he begins translating and assisting in the translation by others of the Bible into English. He's firmly convinced that people need to read the Bible in their native tongue that we shouldn't be simply trusting the authority of those who claim to know without doing the homework ourselves. And so he wants to make the Bible available in the common language. The Catholic Church had never refused that. The Catholic Church has simply said it needs to be an authorized translation. And of course, what Wycliffe is doing here is an unauthorized translation, but it was the only one available. And so this is taking place kind of during this time frame as well. Everything sort of hits the fan, and we really pick up his story in some detail, in the year 1376. In 1376, he published a document called De Civili Dominio, which means on civil dominion. And in this document, he really, for the, uh, kind of in a, in a very frank and bold way, challenges the way in which the Catholic Church and the Pope in particular were carrying on their political activities. All of this is happening during the Hundred Years' War. All of this is happening while the Pope is supporting the French. All of this is happening when the English psyche is becoming increasingly distrustful. And so he wins something of a ready hearing, a ready audience among the English as he publishes this document. 
But some of the things that he says in this De Civili Dominio would be this. Number one, the king is above the pope in temporal matters in, under his own jurisdiction. It's a direct repudiation of unum sanctum, which had come from Boniface VIII years earlier, the claim that the pope is over all civil authority. So what Wycliffe is saying is that each country has a king, and in that kingdom, under that king's jurisdiction, the king has authority in temporal matters, not the pope. This may seem to us like a fairly obvious thing, but at the time, those were fighting words, you understand. I want you to notice here that Wycliffe is not anywhere near some idea of representative government in this document. That is still going to come. That's still future. Who's the first guy that really maps out a theory of representative government rather than a king ruling over a domain? The first guy in history to really give us that kind of political theory is a guy by the name of, anybody know? Herm, you know. John Calvin who is sometimes called the inventor of America, because he's the guy that gave us that notion that authority should be vested in the office, not the person, you see. That's why, from the English point of view, the American Revolution was sometimes called the Presbyterian Revolution. Did you know that? That was the common way to refer to it in England. We call it the Revolutionary War. They called it the Presbyterian Revolution because it was a Calvinistic idea that drove the revolution, namely that there shouldn't be a king there should be an office, and the authorities in the office. Well, Wycliffe's not there. I'm only mentioning this to say Wycliffe still accepts that there should be a king. We're still earlier in Western history, and so, but, it, but the king should have absolute authority in matters temporal. Second thing he argues, the Avignon system was fully corrupt, and he documents example after example after example to prove really, I think, to any fair-minded person's satisfaction that what was happening now in this Avignon papacy didn't represent any kind of credible religious leadership in the church whatsoever, but simply represented a corrupted kind of uh, really reducing the church in some ways to a pawn, serving the purposes of the French king. He argues that the pope himself is subject to the word of God. Now, again, we would think that's kind of a no-brainer, but this was hotly controversial then and remains somewhat controversial to this day. There is in Roman Catholic understanding, and this is true to this day, an idea that the church wrote the Bible. You see, I've had good solid Catholic friends tell me that point blank in those words. Well, the church wrote the Bible. And if the church wrote the Bible, then obviously the author of the document has the authority to interpret the document. And so if the church wrote the Bible, the church has the right to tell you what the Bible means. You should read the Bible, but you should never interpret it to have any meaning other than what the magisterium decrees. And the magisterium is the official interpreter of the Bible in the Roman Catholic Church, you see. So if I reach a conviction on some verse in the Bible that seems to contradict what the Catholic Church teaches, then I've simply misinterpreted it by definition because the church wrote the Bible and can tell me what it means. You follow me there? Well, that was the view that was pretty much accepted, you know, uh, carte blanche at the time. Wycliffe challenges that. The Pope is under the authority of the Scriptures. The church is under the authority of the Scriptures. The church didn't write the Bible. The church received the Bible as the Word of God. I don't know that you could get much closer to the underpinnings of the difference that separated Catholics from, from Protestants at the time of the Reformation than that one point. It's a point of authority, and really everything else sort of flowed out of that. So Wycliffe is a pre-Reformation reformer for that point alone, let alone what else he may have said. He said that church leaders should lead modest lives, that they shouldn't be living in this over-the-top kind of display of of, of opulence and, and luxury that was just, in Wycliffe's view, obscene. He thought that Christian people should, whatever else they do, not be kind of a conspicuous in their display of wealth and certainly shouldn't use that as some sort of uh, proof that God was therefore uh, sort of uh, giving his imprimatur to anything that uh, the church may be doing. He said the Lord's Supper was a sign and seal of the spiritual presence of Christ. He doesn't go as deeply into this as either Luther or especially Calvin would, 
at a later time, and he doesn't really reach a Calvinistic view of the sacrament. This would be more, at least if you read Wycliffe on this point, it sounds a little bit more like the Zwingli approach, which you'd find generally in the Baptist tradition. Calvin has a little bit of a different take on it. I don't want to deal with that right at the moment. But he does repudiate the notion of transubstantiation. He doesn't think that there's any sort of miracle happening in the sacrament. Rather, this is simply Christ communicating his presence to us in a special way through the, the bread and wine, but the bread and wine remain bread and wine, according to Wycliffe. He said that the scriptures should be the supreme guide of the church, and the scriptures were for everyone, not for the scholars, not for the elite, not for the select few with special training, but that every human person should not only read the scriptures, but if they're not able to, be trained, given literate ability so that they can, that every Christian has the right and the responsibility to read and interpret the scriptures correctly for him or herself, not distort them, not misread them or some such thing, but nevertheless that that's something every Christian should be about. This document that was published by Wycliffe in 1376 had, as you can imagine, a strong appeal to the civil princes in England, who were, of course, in this ongoing conflict with the French, in which the French kept saying, well, the Pope is on our side, you guys are therefore wrong. And this document, very well written, very scholarly in its research and reasoning, gave them a position to work from that had some credibility and say, no, we're not so sure about that. We think that maybe you've misunderstood, and maybe the Pope has misunderstood his role. At the same time, in England, there was a very strong reaction by the ecclesiastical princes. England is not by any means monolithic. There is not a united view. You still have very strongly committed Roman Catholics in England who are faithful regardless of what the Pope does. Whatever the Pope does is right just because he does it, that kind of view. You've got people kind of in the middle, and you've got folks who were lining with Wycliffe kind of on the other extreme of the spectrum. And the whole land is sort of up for grabs in some ways in a kind of tumultuous disunity over this point. And so this is the circumstance in which this document is received. But he does get a lot of support, at least from some quarters. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the next year, 1377, Gregory the 11th issues a papal bull in which he condemns Wycliffe's writings. Uh, I'm just going to give you the uh, most salient portion of it, which reads as follows, quote, John Wycliffe is vomiting out of the filthy dungeon of his heart, the most wicked and damnable heresies. He hopes to deceive the faithful and lead them to the edge of destruction. He wants to overthrow the church and bring ruin on the land. Arrest Wycliffe immediately and hold him until a church court can be convened to pass final sentence. So that's the Pope's order. And at this point, even though there's questions about the Pope's authority, essentially that direct order is is embraced, and so Wycliffe is brought to trial in 1378. It's a trial that took place, a church trial is, uh, in a sense, at Lambeth, which is in England, and uh, things were not going overly well for Wycliffe. He was defending himself admirably, but it was in that year, 1378, the year that I told you to remember a few minutes ago, that you recall Gregory XI died, and the church was thrown into chaos because all of a sudden you got two different popes both claiming to be the pope. And all of a sudden the Catholic faithful are thrown into chaos themselves. They don't know who's the pope. And you've got this conflict and this papal schism, and essentially it causes the trial of John Wycliffe to grind to a halt. And he walks out the door uncondemned, uh, not acquitted either. It just the whole thing sort of collapses because the church authority itself has been thrown into question. And it gives Wycliffe another several years now in a more consolidated way to continue his labors, to train young men. And these lollards are in increasing numbers going out through England, through Germany, through other parts of Europe, representing these views that had been worked out by Wycliffe in the writings that he had prepared at that point. Well, finally, there is a kind of uh, settling down, the dust settles as it were, and in 1382, the church once again reconvenes now, some years later, to once again take up the cause or the question of John Wycliffe. 
And so once again, there's a council that's held, a trial of John Wycliffe on charges of heresy, the effect of which could be that he would be burned at the stake. But right in the middle of the trial, there's a great earthquake. And everybody's terrified and they go running out of the place. And there's two views as to the meaning of that earthquake. One, this is God's judgment because he's upset because we're, we're trying to condemn John Wycliffe. This is to vindicate John Wycliffe. That was one view. The other view, God is upset because we haven't yet condemned John Wycliffe. We need to get to it. So, you know, division of the house. And, but in any event, the earthquake does prevent this process from continuing. As it turns out, Wycliffe himself died two years later of a stroke. He was uh, not an old, elderly man necessarily, but he'd never been in very good health. He was kind of slight of build and never had very strong constitution. He had a stroke and died in 1384. But even during those last two years, he continued his labors with a fair degree of uh, earnest uh, effects. So uh, that's the story of John Wycliffe. It's only half told because one of the most important followers of John Wycliffe, a man who was deeply affected and shaped by the influence of Wycliffe was our friend John Huss. And so I want to pick up the story really right there and tell chapter two of this uh, next week. But with that uh, little thought in mind, I'd like to once again return you to this psalm and think about what the psalmist says here with John Wycliffe in the back of our minds. Wycliffe, uh, I think, would have agreed with every line of this and wept probably with every line of it. Oh, how I love your law. He devoted his life to the love of the Word of God and of the law of God. And he was certainly willing to put his life on the line repeatedly for the sake of that precious document. I know you've been reminded of this many times, but we need to hear it again and again. That this book that we take for granted, that is so freely available to us, came at the cost of the blood of a whole lot of people, didn't it? And the fact that we can enjoy it and read it and so on is a great blessing. And the love that Wycliffe had, I hope, to some degree fills each of our hearts. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. It was meditating on the law of God that really reshaped Wycliffe's understanding of himself from being Wycliffe-centric to being Christ-centric. We all need that. We all need that medicine that comes by the scriptures. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. Wycliffe had enemies, and he firmly believed he was wiser than they were, and he believed he was wiser than they were, these enemies who wanted to kill him, stop him, silence him, burn him. These enemies, he believed he had greater wisdom than they because he was being informed by the truth of the scriptures. I have more understanding than all my teachers. That's the favorite verse of my students at school. <laughs> they like to quote it to me, you know. <laughs> For your decrees are my meditation, but there is truth to it. As we meditate on the scriptures, it gives us the apparatus to think about life as it really is, and even to critique our teachers. I hope you critique me. I hope all the time you are critiquing me. Lovingly, I hope, you know, but... Nevertheless, all of us need to be sitting at the feet of the scriptures, and that's where our wisdom truly originates. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. Notice the psalmist ties understanding to keeping. There is one of these fundamental principles in the Christian life that if I know by God's word I'm to do something and I don't do it, my understanding becomes clouded. Obedience to what I know God is calling me to do is the key to further understanding. Disobedience will cloud my mind in darkness, and I'll begin to come up with all kinds of ridiculous excuses and misapplications of the Scripture leading me off into strange and inappropriate directions. It's obedience to what I understand that leads me to greater understanding. I will keep my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. Do not turn away from your ordinances, for you have taught me. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. We will eventually talk about Jonathan Edwards, who comes, of course, some hundreds of years later, great American Puritan preacher, as you know, 
Many people think of Jonathan Edwards as a hellfire brimstone preacher because the only exposure they've ever had to him is the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, preached during the Great Awakening at Enfield. And unfortunately, while that's a wonderful sermon and certainly worth our study, it does give a rather misguided understanding of the broad sense of Edwards. If people have done this, by the way, gone through and just done a statistical study of the adjectives that, you, that were used by Jonathan Edwards to describe God. And by far, the adjective that Edwards used more than any other word to describe God was the adjective sweet. And all through his writings, we find this evidence of his own experience of the sweetness of being in fellowship with God. And so while he could certainly speak powerfully on the wrath of God and the terrifying circumstances of those who are living in disobedience to God, at the same time his appeal was, at, was also to taste and see that the Lord is good. And the psalmist has something of that here. Through your precepts, I get understanding. I hate every false way. John Wycliffe and many others down through history, I think, would be great examples of what we find in that text. And I hope that's been encouraging to you. And I'm done.